Hello everyone, Mark here from Casting Through Ancient Greece. I just want to quickly announce a book giveaway that I'll be running to see out the year, that being 2021. I was thinking long and hard about what book would be suitable for a giveaway at this point of the series. Looking back over the last year, we have spent most of the year with the Greek and Persian Wars in one way or another. Coupled with this and a book recommendation that I've made a number of times, I've decided to put up two copies of Persian Fire by Tom Holland. Many of you have been following the show when I'm a big fan of this book due to its accessibility to Greek history, as well as its entertainment value. These, I think, make it an excellent book for those just starting to get to grips with this period, though I also believe it is an entertaining read for those already familiar with the Greek and Persian Wars, with some new insights to be had. Hopefully my series has also done the same for many of you. To go into the draw for this giveaway, all I ask is that you like and retweet or share my pinned post, which is the show trailer on social media. You can find it on my Twitter profile, at Casting Greece, or on Facebook at Casting Through Ancient Greece. Extra points if you retweet or share with a message to everyone. For the second copy, this will be up for grabs for my Patreon members. To be in the draw, all you need to do is be a Patreon member of Casting Through Ancient Greece. I will leave the draw open until the end of the year, where I will draw winners on the 1st of January 2022. I will announce the winners on social media and contact them via message to arrange postage. Thank you and good luck. The Dorians have wandered often and far, for in the days of King Deucalion, it inhabited the land of Pythia. Then the country called Histiaean, under Ossa and Olympus, in the time of Doris son of Helen. Driven from this Histiaean country by the Cadmians, it settled about the Pindus, in the territory called Macedonian. From there again it migrated to Dropia, and at last came from Dropia into the Peloponnese, where it took the name of Dorian. Herodotus. Hello, I'm Mark Selleck and welcome back to Casting Through Ancient Greece, Episode 43, The Greek Periphery, Macedon. Well, we have now covered two of our destinations in this look at the Greek periphery. Firstly, we headed west and looked at the island of Sicily, that would become to be called Magna Graecia, along with southern Italy by the Romans because of the number of Greek colonies that would dot their lands. We began by looking at the early history of the island and the indigenous cultures that had occupied it. We then moved on to the period that would see Sicily enter into the Greek periphery with the establishment of trade networks, then leading to colonies being founded. This saw a complex network of interactions take place in the region with the Greeks, indigenous Sicilians, and other foreign cultures such as the Phoenicians, who were also present on the island. Political developments in the Greek colonies would mirror those that were taking place on the Greek mainland, with conflicts on the island also becoming more frequent as more colonies were being founded and expansionism was taking place. Competing interests between the Greeks and Carthage, originally a Phoenician colony, would come to a head where we would then focus on the breakout of the First Sicilian War, which brought us up to a period at the end of the Greek and Persian Wars. Next we turned our attention to the lands northeast of central Greece, where various Neolithic cultural groups would be identified. Here one of these groups would be seen to have been the ancestors of the people that would be coined the Thracians by the Greeks. This collection of tribes would be the result of Neolithic cultural groups' interactions with various Indo-European migrations that would take place over millennia. Appearing out of the Bronze Age and its collapse would be the Thracians, that we see referred to by many Greek and Roman writers. We had turned our focus on Thracian history in the 6th and early 5th centuries BC, where we first tried to get an understanding of the Thracians at war. We found that any detailed account of their military actions in this time were near to non-existent, but we were able to draw out an idea from later sources which looked back to their traditions. We then looked at the Thracians as their lands became increasingly part of the Greek periphery, with many Greek colonies being established along the coastlines. Finally, we then turned to the Thracians' territory becoming a crossroads for the Persians on campaign, where they would control parts of Thrace while mounting campaigns north against Scythia. Then Persia would launch its invasion of Greece, seeing Thracian territory under its tightest control from the Persians yet. Though, as we saw, with the Persian defeat, Thrace would become a very inhospitable land for the retreating Persian forces. Now we'll be looking at lands in roughly the same area, north of central Greece but to the west of Thracian lands, though these territories would overlap at times. This would be the region that would become to be known as Macedon. When bringing up the subject of ancient Macedon, one's mind probably turns immediately to Alexander the Great and perhaps to a lesser degree his father, Philip II. These two figures were at a time where Macedon had developed as a powerful kingdom, 
subjugating the Greek city-states, before then under Alexander the Great, carving out the largest empire yet seen as he campaigned through Persia. Though this more well-known period of Macedonian history would be some 150 years in the future of where we'll be taking our look at Macedonian lands up to. We'll begin by looking at the prehistory of the region and what appears to have been taking place. We're then looking to see if we can get an understanding of how the people identified as being the later Macedonians would develop. We will look at the society of Macedon and its structures before then looking at the interaction with the wider Greek world. And just a note, there are a lot of references to ancient place names that we have not yet come across and some hazy accounts to try and follow along with. So on the episode page on the website, I have put up a number of maps that will hopefully make following along where these places were a little easier. Once again, as with the Thracians, we are looking at a people that didn't have hard and fast borders to their territory. In their early history, we are dealing with various tribes that a Macedonian title couldn't even be given to. As they would begin to organise around a more stable system of government in the Archaic Age, then we can start to see a clearer territory be established. Though, the borders of even these lands would blur with other cultures that neighboured theirs. We can still get a general idea of the lands that they would occupy though, as they had been seen to develop in a central region. The lands of Macedon would occupy parts of the western and central Balkan region, just north of Greece and south of continental Europe. These territories would also see a land link to the various seas in the region, the Aegean, the Adriatic and the Black, making the lands a cultural crossroads. The modern nation of northern Macedonia would only occupy a small portion of these lands from ancient times. The lands of Macedonia would have a wide range of geographical features that would shape the people and their way of life. The rugged nature of the territory would be made up of high mountains, valleys and forests, with various rivers and passes making their way through these features. Though down towards the coastal regions, open plains would also add to the features of the seemingly wild lands, which would encourage contact with other neighbouring cultures. These coastal plains would be seen as an ideal location to engage in trade, but would also see outsiders look to found their own colonies and even contest Macedonian tribes for control of some. Though, what motivated these outside peoples to focus on this location was the natural resources that Macedonian territory abounded with, such as copper, gold and wood from its dense forested regions. So with a basic understanding of what the lands of Macedonia look like, Let's see if we can drill down to try and get a generalised idea of the rough boundaries that would encompass these lands. For the ancient Greeks, Mount Olympus would define a natural border between the lands of the most northern region connected to central Greece, that of Thessaly, and that of the southern parts of Macedonian territory. The pass of Tempe that we saw the Greeks initially attempt to defend Xerxes' invasion would be one point that would see the two lands connected through. One of the major rivers running through Macedonian territory would be the Strymon, and east of this would be another series of mountain ranges, the Rhodop Mountains that would see a natural border with the Thracian lands. To the west and north would be more mountain ranges running through the central Balkans that would define the west and north of their territory. Though the lands that were bordered here were also with tribal cultures, so this would have seen these parts very fluid when it came to boundaries. Hopefully this gives a rough idea of the lands that we'll be focusing on. But we just need to keep in mind that over this period, the Neolithic through to the Archaic periods, these boundaries would fluctuate somewhat. Though what we have outlined gives us a rough view of the territory that the Agid monarchy of Macedon would control around the beginning of the 5th century BC. When it comes to the Neolithic period in Macedonian territories, we are looking at a very similar picture as what we saw when looking at Thracian lands, which makes a lot of sense since their territories would overlap at different periods. The Vinga culture that we saw as perhaps being an origin point for the earliest ancestors of the Thracians were quite widely spread, which saw their culture being in what could be considered Macedonian territory, as well as other regions in the Balkans. The concept of Macedonians as a people would develop quite late, with there not even being a reference to the Macedonians in the Iliad, but some names of regions are referred to that would be part of what we would consider later Macedonian lands. This, as you can imagine, makes it very difficult to trace their ancestry into Neolithic times. Early Greek writers would refer to Macedonian migrations into these lands during the Bronze Age, but we will explore this more when we turn to the earliest references to the Macedonians. Though it is quite possible that, like the Thracians, their development would be born from prolonged interactions with multiple cultures over thousands of years. Even if the Macedonians themselves migrated into their new homelands, their interactions with the local tribes would have seen these cultures also, over the generations, become what the Greeks would recognise as Macedonian. 
We have seen this when looking back at many populations where two or more distinct groups would interact through a complex mix of conflict, cooperation and compromise. Over time these separate groups would begin to be indistinguishable, often seeing the culture that is more familiar to us today. Having said this though, there are some interesting sites in these territories dating to Neolithic times that show a different picture to the lands that the Greeks would often see as uncivilised backwaters. Despilio is a site located in what is termed Upper Macedonia, being the mountainous region north of Thessaly. The remains of the site were located on the shores of Lake Historia, in what is known as the Halicomon Corridor. This had been recognised as a popular route for trade and other travellers through much of the ancient times, so it appears that this may even be the case back in the Neolithic period. The settlement appears to have been occupied from about 5600 to 4000 BC, and archaeologists found a number of items dating to this period. They uncovered examples of ceramics, wooden structures, seed, bone, figurines, and jewellery. The context of these finds also indicates a sophisticated society, with it thought they engaged in fishing, hunting, cultivation, and stock raising. Also uncovered at the site is what has been called the Despilio Tablet, which some believe to be one of the earliest examples of writing, even predating the scripts that developed over in Mesopotamia. The tablet has been carbon dated to 5260 BC, with the tablet itself made of wood. The script itself has yet to be identified or deciphered, though there is some debate around if the symbols can be classed as writing. The argument revolves around if it is proto-writing, being a primitive precursor to writing which records information, or could it be a form of writing in the sense that it is used to record language, like what developed in Mesopotamia 2000 years later. Work on the Despilio tablet continues, but in the meantime debate around its relevance is ongoing, with it potentially rewriting our understanding of the development of writing if more can be learnt about the symbols and their context. Just briefly before we move on, the site of Ayani in the same region would be discovered to have some impressive public works with multi-storey houses with drainage systems, while also having some monumental tombs. These would date to the archaic and classical times, but the site of Ayani would show that it had a very long history with it discovered that it had been continually occupied since the Neolithic period. The reason for its continued occupations is most certainly down to the region's geography, with a number of passes leading south into Thessaly and west into Epirus coming through the region. So with this brief look at the prehistory of the region, let's now move on to where we start hearing of the peoples in the region being referred to as Macedonians. Attempting to find a clear and accurate origin point of the Macedonians here is not going to be our aim as scholars are still attempting to do the same with the sources that exist today. The written sources that we have come from the mythical past or from writers recounting legend well before their own time. Perhaps we could begin by looking at what can be found in the Greek's mythic past. As we said, Homer does not refer to the Macedonians by name, but in a passage from the Iliad where Hera descends from Olympus to Troy, he does make references to regions that would become to be seen as being in Macedonian territory. First she dropped to the Pyrian range and to lovely Amathia, then passed swiftly over the snowy mountains of the horse breeding Thracians, the very highest peaks, but never setting foot on the ground. The Pyrian ranges are located just north of Mount Olympus and the site of Iani that we just spoke of was established at the base of these ranges, while Amathia would be in the coastal plains around the Thermaic Gulf, where the eventual formation of the Kingdom of Macedonia would take place. So it has been pointed out that in Homer's time, there doesn't appear to have been an identified people known as Macedonians, well to the Greeks anyway, though this doesn't mean that the people that were present in the area wouldn't eventually be recognised under this grouping. There is also some evidence that there was in fact people known as Macedonian in this early period. Probably one of the earliest references to Macedon appears in a work by Hesiod, which survives in fragmentary form, called the Catalogue of Women. Hesiod was a poet and is thought to have been active sometime between 750 and 650 BC, around the same time as Homer by some accounts, though some believe Homer may have been writing earlier. As we'll see in a minute, this could explain the name Macedon coming onto the scene, as historical writers would make reference to the formation of the Aegead monarchy, being the first reference to a historical Macedonian kingdom. The formation of this kingdom is thought to have taken place around 700 BC, so it is possible this could have taken place between when Homer and Hesiod were writing. Anyway, back to Hesiod's account. In the Loeb edition Hesiod, Homeric Hymns, Epic Cycle, Homerica, we find the following fragment. 
The district Macedonia took its name from Macedon, the son of Zeus and Thyre, Deucalion's daughter. As Hesiod says, And she conceived and bare to Zeus, who delights in the thunderbolts, two sons, Magnus and Macedon, rejoicing in horses, who dwell around Pyria and Olympus. Here we can see the eponymous founder of the Macedonians was born from the daughter of Deucalion, who would be a common link to many founding ancestors of cities. We can also see here that the lands referred to that Macedon is supposed to have lived in would also become the lands of later Macedonia. Casting Through Ancient Greece is an Amazon Associate member. As an Amazon Associate, I earn from qualifying purchases. What this has allowed me to do is recommend books to you guys that are relevant to the episode I am presenting. The books I'll be recommending I have read myself and made use of during the writing of the series. If you are interested in purchasing what I have recommended, using the link of the book on the episode page of my website will help support the series with providing me a small commission. For this episode I am going to recommend Ancient Macedonia by Carol J. King. This resource has proved to be a great help in understanding the early history of Macedonia, while also highlighting other great sources to inquire into. If you head to the episode page for the Greek periphery Macedon on the Casting Through Ancient Greece website, you can find the link to Ancient Macedonia by Carol J. King. Additionally, if you would like to become a member of Audible, the largest collection of audiobooks on the internet, you can click on the Audible banner on the Casting Through Ancient Greece website to gain a 30-day trial membership where you'll also find a number of the books I'll be recommending. Have you been enjoying the series and want to show your support in some way? You can visit www.castingthroughancientgreece.com and click on the Support the Series button. Here you will find many ways you can help the series grow, from subscribing, getting involved in social media, and leaving reviews where you listen to your podcasts. Other options also include assisting with my Amazon wishlist for resources and supporting the series on Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee. The support I have been receiving so far has been fantastic. So a big thank you to everyone who has been helping me grow the series. So there we have a couple of references from myth through ancient poets. Now I want to turn to the earliest accounts found in historical records. Although I say historical accounts, they are coming from a place of tradition. As we should all be aware of, Herodotus is well known for passing on traditional accounts and tales, but it doesn't necessarily mean they are completely factual. Herodotus would be our earliest source for the formation of the Argeid House of the Macedonians, though he recounts a period thought to be over 250 years before the time he was writing. He provides his ancestry in the context of the Greco-Persian Wars, which is the main subject of his work. He takes some time out for a small digression, which he is well known for, when Alexander I comes up in the narrative. This Alexander would not be the famous Alexander the Great, but an ancestor of his, who was the king of the time during the Greco-Persian Wars. We will spend a bit of time around Alexander I once we turn to looking at Macedonia during the Greek and Persian Wars. Something I just want to keep in mind as we continue is that the Macedonians and the royal dynasty that would form are in just about all ancient accounts treated as two different groups of people, but we will address this as we continue. Herodotus in passing indicates that there was a people in the Late Bronze Age to Early Iron Age, known as the Macedoni, that would settle in the Pindus Mountains stretching from southern Albania into northern Greece. They were a part of what he calls the Dorian Invasions, though as we have pointed out a few times, perhaps more accurately migrations rather than invasions. But I think our biggest takeaway here is to see that these Macedonians that appear to be intersected with many other tribal groups of this period as being a different entity than the Macedonian kingdom that would be formed to bring together this region a few hundred years later. A considerable amount of time would pass in the region that would see what appears to be constant movements of people in a world that had just dealt with the Bronze Age collapse. As I have said, Herodotus provides us one of the earliest Macedonian kings lists, but later writers would also refer to the same lineage of the Macedonian royal house. This has seen the suggestion that there was perhaps an official king's list that existed at the Macedonian court that writers such as Herodotus could have access to. Further to this, Herodotus recounts what is thought to be the court's official account of how the royal dynasty of Macedon was established. We need to keep in mind that these early accounts we get through Greek writers are what we mainly have to work with when looking for an official history of the early Macedonian kingdom. So let's take a look at what Herodotus records, and by extension, what seems to be the official line taken by the Macedonians themselves into the 5th century. 
The founding of the royal house is referred to as the Ogier dynasty, since the origins of it can be traced back to the city of Argos, six generations before Alexander I. Though it has also been called the Tamir dynasty, for reasons we'll get to. The founding tradition would also see the Macedonian royal house descending from a Doric line, and the Heraclidae. As in Herodotus's version, Temenus, who was one of the Heraclidae, involved in the successful retaking of Mycenae, would become king of Argos, and would be the ancestor of the first king of Macedon. Also, as we'll get to, Temenus was included in the Macedonian kings list, along with two other earlier kings later on, with perhaps a revised official list made after Herodotus's time. Anyway, I think we'll read out what Herodotus writes around the founding of the dynasty of Macedon. This Alexander was seventh in descent from Perdigus, who got for himself the tyranny of Macedonia, in the way that I will show. Three brothers of the lineage of Temenus came as banished men from Argos to Illyria, Goanes and Oropus and Perdiccas, and from Illyria they crossed over into the highlands of Macedonia till they came to the town of Libya. Here we can see this was quite a journey, with Argos down on the Peloponnese and Illyria would be to the west of what would be known as Macedonian lands. One would think for a group descended from a ruler they would have had some sort of connection with the lands up north for them to head into exile there. Anyway, back to Herodotus' account. There they served for wages as labourers in the king's household, one tending horses and another oxen. Perdiccas, who was the youngest, tended the lesser flocks. Now the king's wife cooked their food for them, for in old times the ruling houses among men, and not the common people alone, were lacking in wealth. Whenever she baked bread, the loaf of the labourer Perdiccas grew double in size. Seeing this kept happen, she told her husband, and it seemed to him, when he heard of it, that this was a portent signifying some great matter. So he sent for his labourers and bade them depart from his territory. They said it was only just that they should have their wages before they departed. When they spoke of wages, the king was moved to foolishness, and he said, That is the wage you merit, and it is that I give you, pointing to the sunlight that shone down the smoke vent into the house. Goanes and Aropus, who were the elder, stood astonished when they heard that, but the boy said, We accept what you give, O king, and with that took a knife which he had on him, and drew a line with it on the floor of the house round the sunlight. When he had done this, he three times gathered up the sunlight into a fold of his garment and went on his way with his companions. So they departed, but one of those who sat nearby declared to the king what this was that the boy had done and how it was of a set purpose that the youngest of them had accepted the gift offered. When the king heard this, he was angered and sent riders after them to slay them. Now Herodotus doesn't elaborate on the meaning of Perdiccas' acceptance of this payment though some have put forward that it has some connection to the symbology of the Virginia Star, now North Macedonia's national emblem. This symbol had been uncovered in a number of excavations with it thought that it was a royal emblem with a connection to the god Apollo. Anyway, to continue on with what Herodotus says. There is, however, in that land a river, to which the descendants from Argos, these men offer sacrifice as their deliverer. This river, when the sons of Temenus had crossed it, rose in such a flood that the riders could not cross. So the brothers came to another part of Macedonia and settled near the place called the Garden of Midas, son of Gordius, where roses grow of themselves, each bearing sixty blossoms and of surpassing fragrance. In this garden, according to the Macedonian story, Selenius was taken captive. Above it rises the mountain called Bermenus, which none can ascend from for the wintry cold. From there they issued forth when they had won the country and presently subdued all the rest of Macedonia. In Herodotus' account, we can see references to three different parts of Macedonia that Perdiccas had travelled to, Upper, another part, and the rest. The historian Carol King in her book Ancient Macedonia has put forward the suggestion that these references might reflect a period of expansion taking place over three phases, where she lays these out as Arrival in Orestus and displacement of the indigenous rulers, relocation to Mount Berimon, and possibly Western Peria, and expansion into the Central Plain. As we will see, these expansions would be seen as taking place over a number of generations. Herodotus' account also aligns with the notion that the Macedonian court descended from Greeks. We often find in the ancient accounts 
that Macedonian royalty descended from Greeks, while the people they ruled were the indigenous tribes of the Balkans. We can see this illustrated when Herodotus has Alexander I referring to himself when addressing some Persians. You may tell your king who sent you that a Hellene, his governor of the Macedonians, has welcomed you warmly with both bed and board. Though to draw a clear distinct line of if the early Macedonians had Greek roots or not, I think is way too simplistic to approach. As we have seen with the Indo-European migrations and the Bronze Age in the past, the Balkans and Central Greece had many periods of population movement, both heading south and north. I have no doubt that the languages and ideas that entered both lands from Indo-European migrations would see a common root in these aspects, as the Hellenic line of languages would emerge. Also, there would be some of the same elements present, like in Greece, that saw the ancient Greeks emerge. Migrations had mixed with the indigenous populations, or as the Greeks called them, Pelasgian. This would be similar with the indigenous tribes of the Balkans. There would have been a mixing of outside influence, which appears to be similar or with the same origins as what entered Greece. Not only this, but later on Greek populations would interact and even move into Macedonian lands. So I think we can find elements that show Greek connections, but also some that show a separate culture that these elements developed with. What is clear is that the Greek mainland in classical times saw a distinction between themselves and the Macedonians. The time that elapsed between many of the migrations, I think would see this notion take hold, where both areas would develop on their own paths, but with some similar origins culturally. As I said, the classical Greeks saw a difference, but perhaps a more helpful question to pursue that Carol King puts forward is what factors did differentiate the Macedonians in the opinion of the ancient Greeks? So, we have looked at the traditional founding account through Herodotus, and what is thought most likely in the Macedonian court's official line. Though we must acknowledge that there are other later accounts that would push the founding of the dynasty back another three generations. It must be noted here before we continue on, that this earlier founding of the dynasty is often thought by modern historians as a reworking of the official genealogy. With it thought that the motivation lay behind a later king's vague claim to the Macedonian throne to gain more legitimacy, though we're not really sure which one. So what I think we'll do here is go through what is found in Diodorus's work, which seems to be a general representation of this later view. As we will see, there are a couple of core points that still remain consistent with the account Herodotus gives. There followed the period of the Macedonians, Canaeus, who was covetous of possessions, before the first Olympiad, gathered forces from the Argives and from the rest of the Peloponnese. And with this army, he advanced against the territory of the Macedonians. It happened at the same time that the king of the Aristi was at war with his neighbours, who were known as the Adorians. He asked Carneus to come to his assistance and promised to give him half his land, when he had established a peace among the Arestia. The king was as good as his word, and Carinus received the land and ruled as king over it for thirty years. He died in his old age and was succeeded on the throne by his son, who was known as Conius, who reigned for twenty-eight years. After him, Tominus reigned for forty-three years, and Perdiccas for forty-eight years. Perdiccas wished to enlarge his kingdom, and so made inquiry to Delphi. Perdiccas, wishing to increase the strength of his kingdom, sent to Delphi to consult the oracle. And the Pythian priestess replied to him, Stands over wealthy land a might of the kings of Tominus, right noble line of Aegeus bearing Zeus, but swiftly to Batius, rich in flocks, and then when, where thou should see white horned goats, with fleece like snow, resting at dawn, make sacrifice upon the blessed gods, upon that spot, and raise the chief city of a state. Agia. So what we notice here is that the main difference is that the foundation of the dynasty comes from Argos into Macedon has been altered, with Carinus replacing Perdiccas as a connection to Argos. Though what we do see is that the connection to Argos remains intact, as does the notion that the royal dynasty and the Macedonians they would come to rule were two different people. The account attempts to draw the dynastic line back three more generations showing Carinus as being the first to rule over the lands of Macedonia, though the next two kings are glossed over until reaching Perdiccas, who seems to have been given the instrumental role in expanding the kingdom. So now that we have these traditional tales of the Macedonian court's foundation, 
let's try and get a hold on the early expansions that were taking place. Currently, we need to assume that these traditional accounts of the foundations of a ruling family are generally based in some sort of historical fact, as they are all we have to work with. But it has to be noted that it has been argued by some that these, seeming to be the official accounts of the Macedonian court, could have worked their genealogy to show that the connections that they wanted to portray. Though realistically, this can be levelled at just about any Greek city-state and their origin stories. This now sees us at a point where a ruling family that would go on to form a dynasty was now strong enough to bring together a number of tribes and regions that we can now recognise as a collective group, the Macedonians. There appears to be some connection in the early stages to the region of Arrestus, around Lake Astoria, where we looked at some early Neolithic sites. This region can be seen to be associated with the early origin tales. In Herodotus' story, this is perhaps the area Libya was located in. Then we also see this as being the region where Carinus was awarded land for his assistance in the war. Though it is perhaps a little later, and during the time of Perdiccas, that we get some slightly firmer information that Macedonian royal power would establish itself out of the Perian Mountains, north of Mount Olympus and south of the Haliacomon River. Here it would seem Perdiccas would take control of a strategically important site that overlooked the coastal plains around the Thermaic Gulf. This site had shown a long history of occupation, with its obvious value as a settlement recognised long before. Under Perdiccas, this settlement would be renamed Argia, which is situated not far from the modern town of Virginia. This is where it appears the first seat of power of the ruling dynasty would be housed. The site here was located close to the main routes heading north to south and east to west, while also being close to major crossing points of the Haliacomon. From this strong position, the newly established Macedonian kingdom was able to consolidate its gains and gather more influence from its strong position. This would see further expansion take place out into the coastal areas of the Perean Mountains, where they would displace Thracian tribes that had occupied these areas. With this later expansion, Macedon would have its first access to the Aegean, while it also encounter Greek colonies that had been established earlier. These were Methone and Pydna which would remain independent from Macedonian control. Down this coastal region, Macedon would found another city that would become extremely important in the kingdom, as a religious centre at Dion. This would not be the only direction that expansion would take place. The Macedonians had also crossed the Halicomon into the region of Odia, which lay northeast. Once killing and expelling the people of the region, Macedon would now exert its influence into the region. It then seems with control in these areas, Macedonian power now began to exert itself out into the central plain up to the Axios River, just east of modern-day Thessaloniki. It's not known when and how long these expansions were taking place, but they appear to be the general thought of what had been taking place since Perdiccas's foundation of the dynasty. Obviously, not all of this expansion of territory can be attributed to Perdiccas, as it is thought this was all taking place somewhere around 650 BC to 510 BC. This would be the rough extent of Macedonian territory by the time of the rule of the King Amentus I, Alexander I's father. Next episode we'll be turning to Alexander and his rule, where we will look at Macedonia under his kingship, as well as the interactions in the lead up and during the Greco-Persian Wars. Though, before we finish up this episode, I want to go back and try and summarise what we have just covered, as the foundation of the Macedonian Kingdom is not the clearest event to take place in the sources. So hopefully we can end by tying everything into a straightforward summary. Looking back, we can see that a number of tribes existed throughout the Balkan region where Indo-European migrations had interacted with a number of them and would help influence the development of these cultures over the centuries. One of these latest migrations that took place in the Bronze Age is seen to have moved through the Balkans and into Greek lands, possibly seeing some cultural transmission take place with some common root elements around language, and ideas enter into many of these lands. We find Macedonia being mentioned in myth through Hesiod, but it wouldn't be until Herodotus that we get a reference to them in a work of history. Herodotus had put the location of the tribe known as the Macedoni in the Pindus Mountains towards the end of the Bronze Age. Around this area is the region of Arrestus, and where we would see a common early link found with myth and what is recorded in the traditional accounts of the founding of the kingdom. In this region, around Lake Castoria, some interesting Neolithic sites have been uncovered, showing that this had been an important region during this time, 
and into the Bronze Age. Though as we saw, the origin stories that pinpoint on this area seem to present details in different ways. It wouldn't be until the time of Herodotus when we start to hear of the origins of an organised political entity that would become the Macedonians. This would be seen as taking place somewhere around 700 to 650 BC, with the foundation of the Argia dynasty, through Perdiccas being exiled from Argos. Though there would be later accounts that would attempt to show the founding of the dynasty going back another three generations. What these founding stories all show is that it was a Greek family that would form the dynasty that would come to form Macedonia, with all of the tribes that would become part of it. We would start to get on firmer ground with the beginning of the Macedonian Kingdom in the Perian Mountains north of Olympus, where the seat of Macedonian power would be in the city of Agia, near modern day Virginia. From here, expansions of the kingdom would take place over the reign of the first six kings. This would see Macedonian territory head south along the coast of the Aegean, expelling the previous Thracian tribes occupying the area. The lands northeast of the Halicomon would also come into Macedonian possession, while further expansion would move out into the coastal plains around the Thermaic Gulf. This would be the extent of the Macedonian Kingdom when Alexander I's father, Amentus I, would come to rule. It will be this period and Alexander's reign that we will be focusing on next episode. Thank you everyone for your continued support, and a big shout out to all those who have found some value in the series and have been supporting it over on Patreon and other various ways. Your contribution is truly helping me grow the series. I would also like to give a personal shout out to Josh Barnhart for choosing to sign up and support the series on Patreon. I greatly appreciate your decision to do so. If you have also found some value in the show and wish to support the series, you can head to www.castingthroughancientgreece.com and click on the support the series button, where you can discover many ways to extend your support to helping the series grow. Be sure to stay connected and updated on what's happening in the series and join me over on Facebook or Instagram at Casting Through Ancient Greece or on Twitter at Casting Greece. And be sure to subscribe to the series over at the Casting Through Ancient Greece website. I hope you can join me next time for episode 44, Macedon, Balancing Interests. And remember, if you'd like to go into the draw to win a copy of Tom Holland's Persian Fire, just like and retweet or share my pinned post on Twitter or Facebook. Winners will be drawn on the 1st of January 2022.